We've talked about three covenants. We've talked about the blood covenant, the salt covenant, and the sandal covenant. And today we start the wedding covenant. I thought this was going to be probably a two-part series, but I'm afraid. I'm not afraid. Um, I am thinking it's probably going to be more along the lines of three because the depth of what's in this thing. So the wedding covenant. The marriage is a culmination of all three covenants coming together. The blood covenant's there, the salt covenant's there, the sandal covenant's there, and then we enter into the marriage covenant. And we're going to see this as we dive deeper and deeper into this marriage covenant. We're going to see exactly how this is played out. You may be saying, well, what's the glass of wine up there for? Well, for those of you who don't know, it is grape juice. But we do communion, and we take these elements, and sometimes, just like what Jessica was saying about the kids, sometimes we do it out of tradition and not out of understanding. We do things and we go, we why did I understand the do? marriage covenant. We'll, understanding, or we'll start to begin to understand what even this is even all about, this war that we're seeing uh, be played out in front of our eyes. <clears throat> There's many illustrations and references to the marriage covenant from Genesis to revelations. God talks about the marriage covenant. Is there any wonder that the enemy is after the family, the marriage covenant? Because we're going to find out in, in a minute, it's not just about two people. You can't know scripture if you don't know covenant. And you won't understand covenant, especially revelation, if you don't understand the ancient Hebrew rituals and ceremonies because there again it's God's picture to his people saying hey this is how it looks this is what I want you to do this is how it plays out and you go oh okay God wants us to get it that's why he's very symbolic so let's talk about the marriage how it begins so the marriage comes about when two people two young people decide they want to get married. Now, in the Western understanding, boy sees girl, girl sees boy, eyes are flattered, right? A lot of the Western tradition and culture comes from the ancient Hebrew understanding. However, we've lost a lot of what we're doing. And you're gonna, I'm going to tie this in so you can see why we do some of the things that we do. Now, so here's how it happened. We hear that it's an arranged marriage. It's not the arranged marriage that you and I think it is. Okay, when we hear arranged marriage, it's me going to somebody and saying, hey, my son is going to marry your daughter. All right, they may be infants. Okay, now, I'm not saying that did not take place. Okay, but here's the kicker. When that happened, that marriage was not considered legal. Okay, a parent could arrange a marriage like that, but... It was not considered legal, and you're going to understand here in just a minute why. The, the lady of this betrothal, if you will, had to make a decision, okay, before it beco could become legal. Let me say it this way. Types and shadows. Why was it illegal for a parent to arrange the marriage? Why was that not a legal binding thing? Because you have to make a choice. You can't get there on your mom and dad. So the arranged marriage was a young man, a young woman, they kind of fall in love. The boy would go to his father, and he would say, Dad, I really like this girl. And he'd say, well, who is she? And they would find out about the family. So I'm, and, and, and when I say this, this is hours upon hours upon hours upon hours of me reading articles and studying stuff. So I'm giving you just the whew, top of the iceberg, okay? So the dad would say, okay. And so they would devise a plan, and the family would leak out that there might be an official proposal coming. All right? Create a little something in the air, right? So here's what would happen. When that proposal time came, the dad would take his son, and they would go to the prospective bride's house. And they would carry with them a cup, a betrothal cup. All right? And they would carry the price of the bride. Now, it's not really a dowry, okay? I believe the actual Hebrew word is uh, mohar. But they would carry that with them. And it says that they would go to the door and he would knock. 
And the bride's dad would go to the door and he would look out and he'd say, Honey, it's them. Do you want me to open the door? She had an option. Daddy, open the door. Or she would say, No. If she opened the door, that was the very first step. That was salvation, the representation of salvation, sanctification. So they would go in, the father, the son, would go into the bride's house with, his, with her father, and they would begin negotiating. Now, the first thing that would happen, and there's a, there's a little bit of, uh, I've read more articles on it happened than it didn't happen, okay? But I'm going to say for the sake of argument that I, I love the symbolism. So they would go in, and one of the first things that they would do when they would shut the door is, again, it was ask. Now, the ask was not, will you? The ask was, will you? And the bride, if she so desired, she could say, no, it was over, they would leave. Or she would take a drink of the cup, signifying that she is saying yes to this process. So they called Rebecca and they said, are you willing to go with this man? They asked her. And she replied, yes, I will go. We have a servant that comes and asks you, will you marry this man? His name is Holy Spirit. He is the servant of God, so to speak. He's the one that's coming to our heart and saying, hey, are you willing to get into this committed relationship? And we have a choice, yes or no. All men are given this. So we see this that... Um, Mo, or excuse me, in Genesis here, Abraham, Rebecca had a choice. She said yes to this. At any time in the betrothal process, the bride can stop everything. And so the bridegroom, he's totally committed. She can stop this at any time. The opening of the door, the first step of the marriage covenant. It is salvation. That's when the restoration process begins. It is a long and lasting process relationship. The covenants are progressive in nature. You don't get to skip from the front to the back and go to the middle. They're, in, they're progressive. You have to fulfill them. Interesting in enough, the ketubah in the day required seven signatures to be legal. These came from the bride and the groom, the two fathers, a scribe who would later be a, a rabbi, and two witnesses to sign it. You know, there's a, there's a reason on the marriage certificate. It has the bride and the groom's name, and then there's two spots, and it says witnesses. A matron of honor and a best man. Why do we do these things? It goes back to a, a root. It goes back to an understanding. Now watch this. The Torah, God's marriage covenant, has seven major players. Abraham and Noah were the two witnesses. Abraham was the father of the groom. Jacob was the father of the bride. Moses was the scribe. David was the bride. And Yahshua was the groom. If you don't understand Genesis, you, you're going to get confused in Revelation. The last time we see seven seals is in Revelation. Y'all thought it was about angels breaking open a bowl and pouring it on mankind. Seven seals, seven signatures. Hey, guys, look. There's a picture I've painted for you. Don't be afraid. I'm getting my house ready for you. I think we have this picture of funeral music being played. <laughs> no, it's going to be a day of celebrating. My name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'll leave you with this thought. So the tradition was, and we're going to talk about this more next week, but the Father is the one who sets the wedding day. The Bible says, Jesus said, they said, when are you coming back? He says, I don't know. We've, we've understood that to mean Jesus didn't know. He's all, how could he not know? He's part of God, right? 
And he says this statement, he says, that's not up to me, it's up to the Father. In the Hebrew tradition, the Father would tell the Son when to go get his bride. And usually it was after all the preparations had been made. Dad, can I go get her today? Hang on, son. I need you to get that trim right there and get that door fixed. Let's talk about it. Okay. And he would do that. Maybe the next day he'd say, Dad, Dad, I got, is today the day? Not today, son. Not today. This is the tradition. What a beautiful and amazing tradition. If you come back next week, we're going to talk about that tradition, how it unwraps and unfolds. I mean, we have just cracked the book open, chapter 1. We're two paragraphs in to this 66 book, book, and much more. I mean, I'm telling you, it will blow your mind. I want you to understand this today. The Lord's inviting you to a wedding. I didn't want to say this. I'm going to say this anyway. Some of you are going to choose to be the bride. Some of you are going to be okay with just being at the party. I'm going to let you chew on that a while. What are you talking about? Just let it sink in. But he's made a, an amazing invitation to you and I to come be his bride. That's not vulgar. It's not anything bad. It's amazing invitation. Come on. Come be my bride.